Welcome back to my channel. We're going to be talking a little bit about nursing. We'll be talking a little bit about nursing, hospice nursing, and what happens at the end of life. Um, specifically, um, when it gets closer to the actively dying stage. You're kind of probably wondering what all these terms mean, and so we're going to go over First that. thing that I want to clarify is that not every patient goes through each stage at end of life that we expect. Not every patient has all the symptoms that we look for. Every patient is different and every journey is different at end of life, just like everybody's birth is different. First thing that you're gonna see is a patient start transitioning. And when we say transitioning, we mean um, they get less, uh, you're looking for less socialization, more time in bed, decreased appetite, decreased intake overall, changes in urination like they're incontinent, um, things like that called what we would call transitioning they're still um, you know can still be awake they can still be aroused um, but they're spending more time in the bed um, and you can just tell that they're getting weaker um, and their appetite decreasing and all of that they have that decreased need for food a lot of families at that point are concerned that their loved ones aren't eating um, what we tell them is that what I, what I specifically tell them is that if you think about it, um, your loved one is not expending the energy to need that food um, to keep going. Their body's basically going into kind of like hibernation, reserve mode. And another thing is when you eat or drink, especially at that time, your body's actually going to have to expend more energy to digest and to void or to... Um, have a bowel movement when they eat or drink. Something that we have to tell them that the decreased need for food and uh, fluids is is a normal process and that um, their family member isn't going to just starve or become dehydrated. Um, that's not how they will pass away. So after a patient transitions, the next phase usually is what we would call actively dying. Um, and actively dying is when a patient is semi-comatose, um, you know, very minimally um, arousable, maybe slightly responsive to tactile stimuli, um, you know, but their eyes might be slightly opened um, at rest. They're not responding as much to uh, their family's voices or if at all, their NPO other than mouth care, so nothing by mouth. Um, they're completely incontinent. Um, and they're bed, they're bed bound at that point when they're active. And you'll notice things like perhaps change in temperature, modeling, which is the bluish tinge to, um, you can notice them at the extremities, on the hands and feet usually is where it starts, and that can come and go as well. Their breathing may become different, um, so they can get chain stokes or Cheyenne stokes, I don't know, I pronounce it Chain Stokes. I've heard Cheyenne Stokes. To me, it doesn't look like it's spelled Cheyenne, but maybe <laughs> that's just me, which is that rapid breathing followed by a period of apnea, or they can just have more um, regular respirations that are shallow, but they can have that period of apnea as well. And some periods of apnea can last longer than you'd actually think. Like some people can have 20 to 30 second periods of apnea and then just a very shallow breathing. At that point, I would assume that they're very close to passing. Another thing that happens towards end of life when patients are actively dying, but doesn't always happen, right? Because not all patients have the same symptoms at end of life, um, are the terminal secretions. Some people call them the death rattle. I don't know why I have this. I would not chart it as the death rattle. That's not really a, a, a medical term. I guess I would just call it terminal secretions, and that's when those um, secretions sit in that upper airway and their muscles in their throat are basically losing that control to move those secretions up or down. What we tell families at that point is that those the noise tends to it will bother us more than it bothers the patient. The patient doesn't really become um, disturbed by it. They don't feel it um, but we hear it and that can be disturbing and frightening for, for some families and I totally understand. Symptom management for um, terminal secretions um, would be you can use Levison. Um, some agencies use atropine drops which are kind of borderline not used a lot anymore. I'm not sure. Does your agency use atropine drops still? I know that some places have stopped because of um, the hallucinations that it cause, uh, causes. So let me know, does your agency still use atropine for terminal secretions? And other things, non-pharmacologic interventions you can use are turning patients to the side. 
putting a fan in close proximity to the face. Not like right here, we don't wanna get any, any hair caught in there. So it can help dry it out. Uh, you can also do mouth care if it's kind of sitting in there, but don't try to go all the way back in the throat. We don't want any of that. <laughs> You'll see um, at the end of life is um, patients who get sacrament of the sick, usually they'll get them before end of life, um, but sometimes they do still get them right up until they are actively dying, which is something you wanna discuss with your patients probably on admission if that's something, if they're, you know, religious, if that's something that they want towards end of life. At this point, when patients are actively dying, we do uh, nursing visits usually daily um, just to provide support for the family and ensure that we're doing the correct um, interventions that the patients are comfortable. Things can change by the hour at that point, even by the minute. Um, so we just want to make sure that everyone's nice and comfortable and the, the family has adequate support. Also, you want to try to involve the family as much as they're willing um, so that they can help, you know, teach them how to help out with the milk care. To make their loved one comfortable at the end, hand holding, massage, um, you know, if that makes them comfortable. You can also remind them that hearing is the last sense to go so that they can always hear what you have to say. Um, encourage them to you know, tell them that they how much they love their loved one and um, how everything's going to be okay and that it's okay to pass on. Because a lot of patients do need that reassurance. They need closure at end of life. Uh, you'll notice that everybody, every patient's end of life experience is different. Some people want to pass away alone. But they'll wait for people to leave the room and then that's when they'll take their last breath. Or some people are just waiting for that last family member to come and see them. And it's amazing because you wouldn't think that these people would know because they're not, they're unresponsive, semi-comatose. You would think that they might not understand or be aware of what's going on around them. But for some reason, they do know. They know in their heart, um, you know, what they need to get done in order to make their transition to the next life possible and peaceful. What happens when a patient passes? I've been at patient's actually taking their last breath in front, in front of me as a hospice nurse. I've been there about six or seven times in my little over four years of hospice nursing. I don't know if that is a lot. I feel like most of the time we're not actually there for the passing. And that may sound weird because we are hospice and it's kind of our thing. We're not usually there for that last breath, but I've been there about six or seven times. When a patient passes, of course, you want to make sure that you are sure the patient's passed. Um, you listen to the apical heart rhythm for one whole minute, okay? One whole minute. Do not even cut it by a second. You don't want to make a judgment call that is going to be really bad. Once you've done that, of course, you're going to want to let the family know if the family's there. And you have to fill out a death certificate with time of the pronouncement, things like that. So after you filled out the death certificate, of course, the family you want to make sure the family is grieving appropriately all while this is going on. You know, you want to call the chaplain if you, if you know, offer chaplain services or social worker services if you need to, whatever kind of support you need to get in there. Our hospice offers child life services, so if there's any children in the family, say it's their mom or dad or grandpa, grandpa, grandma, or grandpa that they were really close to, um, we want to make sure that they're okay because children have a different way of interpreting death than adults do, obviously. Um, so they're a priority as well. So make sure the family's okay. So once a patient passes as well, um, a common thing that hospice nurses and hospice caregivers in general um, do is open a window. So behind opening the window, some people believe that if the window isn't opened, um, that the soul will be trapped in there. It's a way to let the spirit out or the soul out so that it can move on to the next life. Everybody believes in this. Um, you know, not everybody will even notice it if you do it, you know, but it's kind of our thing. I don't know if you guys ever seen the Johnson & Johnson commercial with the hospice nurse. She opens a window and she's taking care and she says, not today, Mrs. Johnson. And she just shuts the window. So that's the thing that we do. We open the window. It also gives a lot of fresh air because it can feel crowded in there. It does. It, the energy changes. At end of life, another thing to do is post-mortem care. It's an important thing if that is indicated. Okay, something to keep in mind is that every religion has their own customs at end of life. So uh, whether you're Jewish, Muslim, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, uh, Latter-day Saint, every religion might have their own way of 
dealing with that time. So you just want to also make that clear on admission. How would you? How how is the family gonna want things to be handled at that point? If they're comfortable with talking about that at admission, some families aren't so comfortable. You want to make that clear at least when things start to get to the end, so that everyone knows how to act appropriately. You know, so that we're culturally sensitive to everybody. Let's just say this is a normal passing, and that there's no cultural sensitivities to keep in mind. Um, the one thing you're gonna do is post mortem care which is basically a bed bath at the end of life. And you treat it as just this, it's a very blessed thing to be a part of. And sometimes you can, if the family's comfortable, sometimes they'll want to partake in it and do that final moment of care for their loved one, get that final moment, you know, with them and said, involve the families in whatever they're comfortable in at end of life. You wanna address um, the family and ask, you know, how much time, is there anybody that would like to come and see them before you call the funeral home to come get the patient? Um, because you just never know. There could be somebody who's a half an hour away and they just weren't be, you know, they just wanna be there. They just wanna say goodbye for the last time. The funeral homes generally take about an hour, in my experience, about an hour to get there. So the main takeaways. There's two stages at end of life, transitioning and then actively dying, present with diff different symptoms. Once a patient passes away, the nurse does the pronouncement and then um, basically our job is done. And now as nurses, as a hospice, we will follow patients for patients' families up to a year after passing with social services and chaplain and things like that to make sure that um, they're grieving appropriately. A lot of the hospices around um, the United States, I find, do offer other things like, um, I know for mine, we do walks for the families. We have a summer camp for the kids, you know, and they can come every year. It's not even just up to a year. They can come every year, sign up for this free camp to do activities to remember their loved one. People often will say, oh, as hospice, you guys are angels for coming to do this. But in all reality, it's really the families that are the angels, isn't it? because they're giving the, their family member this gift of being able to pass away on their own accordance as their own choosing. Um, death with dignity is what we would call it, in a comfortable matter in their own home. I think that's a pretty amazing gift to give them. So we're not really angels. We love our jobs and um, we do them because we love them, but I think the families are truly, truly, truly the angels here. If, you know, there's different things that you can say that are comforting at end of life. It all depends on the age of the patient, I think, the family situation. So I think if you're a hospice nurse, those things will will just come to you. You'll get more comfortable with, with handling families as you go along. I hope you guys in, uh, got a little bit of knowledge out of it as to, to what the final stages are um, in hospice. Not every patient goes through the same stages at end of life. Not everyone gets all the symptoms um, at end of life, but they're just things to look out for. So give this video a like if you enjoyed it. Um, comment down below if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. I'm not available 24-7 like hospices. I try to comment back when I can. Okay guys, so that wraps up this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, my next video is going to be on symptom management and end of life. We're going to talk a little bit about that. So enjoy. Have a good night.